Hi, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us here. Um, I'm very pleased to see so many attendings, and also I wanted to uh, use this opportunity to introduce my, my colleague here, Abra Mediferia, who's a financial aid advisor at the School of Medicine at Stanford. Um, we'll entertain questions along the way. Um, and what I've done today is I've, used the, uh, I've decided to use the Pain for a Medical Education PowerPoint presentation that is available on the Association of American Medical Colleges website. It's a very comprehensive approach to information that you need to consider as you start your journey. Um, now, you've many of you are thinking or have chosen a health profession career, and it's going to be a huge investment in time and money. Um, so one of the most important things to do as you begin this journey is to educate yourself about what it costs and what resources are available. And hopefully we'll be able to impart some information and answer many of your questions. So where to start? Know the cost. Know what's associated with uh, the cost of attending uh, a medical school. Uh, know what tuition is available, whether it's in-state or out-of-state tuition. Uh, know what the, uh, what the required fees are and the cost of living is in the area. Um, as you may know, private and public, they may be a little bit different. There may be in-state and out-of-state tuition adjustments uh, that are mandated by the different state schools, so you need to understand what those differences are. Uh, understand your financial aid options, and this is where you're going to start uh, considering whether or not the institutions you're applying for have institutional resources, such as grants, which are, uh, not are basically gift monies that you don't have to pay back, whether there are need-based grants, whether there's merit scholarships available, uh, whether there's loan programs available, either federal loan programs or institutional loan programs that you might be eligible for. And also, uh, even outside of the institution, look, look and see if there's scholarship opportunities that are available that you might be eligible for. Okay, so you need to know that it's not just a one size fits all. I think that's the most important message that I have today. It's, it really depends. And so as you start your journey, you really need to educate yourself to explore and learn about those options. The second uh, two parts of the presentation are manage your money wisely and support along the way. Um, and I probably won't get to those two sections, but I encourage you to probably go back if you have an opportunity and uh, go through the entire PowerPoint presentation because it does give you some good uh, techniques and strategies to basically start living on a fixed income now. Because as a medical student, uh, and uh, basically you'll be living on a fixed income. You don't have money to spend outside of the cost of ed education, so you're going to have to start uh, uh, living frugally, if you will, now. And I think that if you start thinking along those lines now, then when you earn your degree and you go out and become a physician, then you'll, you'll actually be able to uh, manage your debt. Uh, Arbor, do you want to uh, add anything to that? I just want to say that there are about 130 medical schools in the nation. When you choose a medical school, you choose tuition and you choose financial aid. So how much financial aid you will be getting, or there are some questions, how much debt I will incur by the time I graduate, it is the choice that you made now. You choose a school, you choose its tuition, whether it is in school, I'm in state or out of state, whether they have very big scholarship or they have only loans. So the choice you make today determines with what type of debt you will be graduating. Okay. So know the costs, and here is uh, the average cost: uh, public, private, uh, tuition and fees. This represents uh, first year, uh, first year only. So uh, if you multiply that by four, you would see what the uh, for your cost of a medical education would be, uh, total cost of attendance would be uh, the uh, tuition plus living expenses. Um, so that's public, that's the average public and private. Uh, I could tell you that at Stanford, the private is about uh, 45,000 is our tuition. So uh, actually it's, it's pretty, pretty close to the private. So we're right in line there. Um, so so you're looking at the price tag, so you're looking at how much it costs. So at the front end, you're making a decision about where am I going to apply and what does it cost, okay? And at the tail end, you're going to say, uh, at the end of my four-year medical education, what type of debt load will I have? 
And so this is the, for the class of 2010, the median education debt for public, private, and all. So you can see that the average debt for anybody going to medical school who applies for loans is about $160,000. That's an investment that you're going to be making in your education. So uh, that also represents that 86% of students that go to medical school actually have applied for some type of loan and have debt. So if you do go to medical school and you do apply for loans, you will not be alone. You're in good company. So uh, it's just it's something that it's almost uh, a, a given that you will uh, apply for for loans if you don't have family resources to pay for a medical education. Okay. Um, so this is a this this represents a sam uh, sample monthly budget of somebody who has um, done internal medicine residency. So they've gone to medical school, they uh, have graduated, or they've taken th three years of resi residency, and now they're working. So this represents, I believe, a hundred uh, ten thousand seven hundred monthly salary. And so, uh, given that they have a hundred eighty thousand dollar debt, or I'm sorry, hundred uh, yeah, hundred eighty thousand dollar debt. This would um, mean that uh, from their monthly salary, two hundred twenty-five hundred dollar, twenty-five hundred or two thousand five hundred would be going to pay repay their debt. Okay, so this gives you an example of yes, you do have debt, but earnings from a uh, from a MD will you'll be able to manage this. Twenty-three percent of your um, monthly budget would be to service your educational debt. Um, so the value of an MD degree, this is just a short little explanation that says, okay, if you decide not to go to medical school, you forego the opportunity to go to medical school, and you start working uh, after you get your BA or BS degree at 22, starting salary 4,000, MD internal degree, start, you don't start working until 29. Um, but you know, how much will you be able to save by the age of 65? This shows that you know, $2 million difference is what you'll have in additional savings by the time you reach your retirement age. So again, just trying to give you an example of the value, the investment that you're making does have value in the long term. Uh, again, average incomes of specialties. Uh, I know that there's questions out there about, well, if I ha incur a huge educational debt, how am I going to pay for it? I want to be a pediatrician. I want to work in a low income clinic in an inner city uh, or in the rural area uh, with farm workers, you know, if I, if I have this huge debt, how am I ever going to repay those debts? Um, you know, this is kind of an average of uh, the uh, income by specialties. Uh, again, the AAMC um, updates these every year, so they do technically go up every year. So know the cost of applying. Um, there, are, there, are, there are uh, upfront expenses to applying to medical school. The AMCAT, AMCAS application fees, the secondary, if your school, you're applying to medical school, they might have a $50, $100 application fees. You might have to travel uh, to interview. You might have to buy an interview outfit, <laughs> you know, a suit and tie and, and, and uh, so on. So you might want to also know that it's, there are some upfront costs associated uh, with applying to medical school that you may not be thinking of now, but you know, as you get closer to that point in time when you, you do make the, the move to apply, you, you probably want to make sure that you uh, are aware of these. Anything to add? And please note that um, at the bottom of most of these PowerPoints are additional URLs, information where you can get additional information, so I'm giving you a very general overview. And I uh, just want you to know that there is uh, additional information available. So understanding financial aid. So what is financial aid? Financial aid is what is available to you when you can't pay for your education. So it's a shortfall between the cost of education and your resources. That is basically, very simplistically, what financial aid is. So it doesn't measure your, uh, it, it measures your ability to pay. And financial aid is then made available to the degree that you can't pay for your, your, um, your education. Um, we fielded a question a little bit earlier about, well, you know, I'm independent. Uh, as, a, as an undergraduate, I need to submit my parents' information to uh, apply for loans for my undergraduate education. Will that still be required uh, in a professional or graduate uh, education? And the answer to that question is maybe. <laughs> So for federal aid, you are required to complete a FAFSA every year. And uh, for federal aid, that's grants, loans, you are 
you are considered um, independent. So that does not require your parental data. For institutional aid, however, and I can use Stanford as an example, what we do is we require students to um, uh, supply uh, parental information uh, as long as the student is under the age of 30. Uh, because students come from a variety of different backgrounds and family circumstances, uh, you know, using the Rockefellers versus, you know, a farm worker. They, they, they have different resources available to them. So our institution does have limited, we have grant resources, but they are limited. So we want to target our need-based money towards the neediest students. So the way that we can differentiate families that have and that have not is by providing parental data. Okay. So uh, grants and scholarships need and, and uh, need and merit-based. Um, again, this will vary from school to school. Some uh, schools have uh, large endowments. Uh, some schools have no endowments. Some schools are state. Some schools are private. Uh, most schools, uh, the grants that they do have are targeted at need-based students. There are a few schools out there that provide merit scholarships, um, you know, based on, you know, your MCAT score or something of that nature. Um, but for the most part, I would say 95% of the medical schools out there provide need-based scholarships, not merit. So, you know, it doesn't depend if you're the top of the class. Uh, yes, they'll accept you, but, you and, but if you have money, you might not get a need-based scholarship, you know, using that as an example. Um, federal student loans, we talked a little bit about. Uh, there's the Stafford sub and unsub loan. There are aggregate limits uh, to those loans um, that you can borrow up to a certain amount. The federal Stafford loan is available up to 65000 and uh, you, as a grad health professional, you actually can borrow more because it takes longer to train a physician. Uh, the annual aggregate is 2,280, 224, 224, sorry, 224. Now there is a, a change on the table right now that um, with the Stafford Loan Program. The Stafford Loan um, is a subsidized loan while you're in school and during the first six months after you graduate, the government pays the interest rate on that right now. Uh, it's on the chopping block to go away, so if by the time you apply, y all of your federal Stafford loan will be unsubsidized, and so that's going to be an additional cost of about four or $5,000, we estimate. Uh, so if you're not eligible for merit or uh, need-based scholarship and you want to finance your uh, medical education, you can do so. I mean, Stafford, Grad Plus, the Perkins loans, the loan for disadvantaged students, the primary care loans, those are loans that would be available to you from the federal government. Now, I want to qualify that the federal loan programs, there are two prerequisites, is that you must be a U.S. citizen or a legal U.S. resident. Those are the two prerequisites for the federal loan program. Um, other sources of aid, of course, is family contributions. You know, can mom, dad, grandpa, uncle, aunt, cousin help? Uh, Service-based scholarship, uh, armed services certainly is one of the, the most popular ones. National Health Service Corps uh, are, is another one, um, and outside scholarships. Uh, our students, uh, there, is a, there is a huge scholarship which is called the Paul and Daisy Soros Scholarship for New Americans that is available for medical students who are first generation U.S. citizens, either their parents or they are first generation, and it pays uh, 36000 for two years, I believe, so a total value of $72,000 to offset your your educational expenses. So again, use, um, use your time and explore these outside scholarships that might be available to you um, because you, know, you, you do need to do a little bit of work. It does, it does require you to do some digging and research. And uh, you know, I uh, strongly recommend that everybody get on the Association of American Colleges website, get a login, visit the aspiring docs and the FIRST because they have uh, references to, um, uh, to scholarship opportunities, and they also provide information about the public service loan forgiveness program and other state and local loan forgiveness programs. Believe it or not, like the state of Oklahoma, the state of Texas, um, actually if you go to school in Texas and you work in Texas, if you go to medical school in Texas, I believe, and you actually uh, go to work in Texas, that they'll forgive your loans. So, you know, there's those type of opportunities that are available. Uh, let's see. Um, 
So we consider ourselves your best friend in medical school. You know, uh, we want you to, as as you start your journey, um, you need to feel comfortable and confident to come to your financial aid officer and ask questions, ask for clarifications. You know, if you don't understand something, ask why. If you think you're eligible for something and you didn't get it, ask why. Um, you know, it might be something on the application that you forgot to fill out, but you know, we're there to help you every step of the way. And uh, I think I can speak uh, pretty much for most financial aid officers across the country. You know, we want to see you succeed. We want to minimize your debt. We don't want you to graduate from medical school with this huge medical school burden, debt burden. So, uh, you know, we'll try to do everything possible to identify resources based on your unique, you know, qualifications. Um, you need to apply for financial aid. You apply for financial aid on an annual basis. Uh, the FAFSA is required. So if you've uh, uh, applied for financial aid as an undergrad, you're probably familiar with it. Uh, as a graduate student, you will also apply for the FAFSA. The only difference is that depending on the school, you may or may not be required to, to, uh, to have your parents' information on the FAFSA. Uh, some schools, such as us, we have a supplemental application, actually two supplemental applications. One's, ca one's called the Need Access, which we do collect family information, income assets, students and in number of siblings in college, and that helps us assess this, the family's financial strength. And uh, we also have a supplemental application, which pretty much just gives us uh, enrollment plans and um, uh, academic, uh, what, what you fields of fields of specialties are going to be. And again, that helps us uh, you know, make selections for uh, uh, restricted funds that we have that might say, you know, we only want to give this uh, scholarship to a student who is serious about pursuing a uh, career in surgery or pediatrics or international medicine, something of that nature. So, uh, you know, each school will vary a little bit, but every school will require the FAFSA as the minimum, okay? Um, and be aware of deadlines, um, you know, make sure that you apply early. And uh, one of the things that we ask is that our students have their families uh, complete their income taxes as soon as possible after January 1st, because uh, some schools, you know, it's like you need to apply early or else, you know, we're gonna give out our scholarship funds and then, you know, you apply late, they might have used up their allocation. Uh, so again, encourage you to pay attention to early deadlines. It's very, very important. And research and apply for outside scholarships. Also, again, you know, it's really up to you. You're your, you're your best uh, friend. Yes, I have a question. Um, in terms of <coughs> time to pay it back, um, how does that work? Is there like a set time or are there various variables? Well, the standard, uh, the Stafford Federal Direct Loan is what you're talking about. So um, you do have, <coughs> currently there's a six months grace period for the subsidized. There's no grace period for the unsubsidized. Um, but uh, the standard repayment period is 10, but you could extend that depending on how much you owe. I think it's over 30,000. You could extend that up to 25 years. And there's also options for income sensitive, graduated. So there's lots of options. So if you say, oh, I've got this huge debt. I'm not going to be able to pay this $250,000 or $2,500 monthly payment. You could, you could work with the Department of Education to adjust your um, your repayment to be income sensitive, uh, graduated, um, and as you, uh, you know, as your income increases, as you go through uh, your practice of medicine, you could adjust it every year. So once you set something up for, let's say you decide a 25 year repayment, and then you decide, um, I want to pay it off earlier, there's no prepayment penalties for that. There's a question over here. Um, do they have low repayment programs while you're in medical school for <coughs> your undergraduate? Program? Do they have uh, repayment programs for undergrad debt, is that what you're saying? I believe, <coughs> pardon me, I believe that um, all of your educational debt, whether it be undergrad debt or medical school debt, are eligible under the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program for your federal debts. Aubrey, correct me if I'm wrong. The question is while you are in school? Yes. Okay, let me explain it. While you are in school, your loans go, doesn't go to repayment. That's the understand. All your loans will remain as it is. It's deferred. When you go to medical school, you will defer your loans until you finish medical school. If the loan is subsidized or if the loan is subsidized by the government and there is no interest, it will remain the same. If it has interest, 
then the interest will accrue. So there is no repayment program while you are in a school because you don't repay loans. Loans are deferred. Does that make it clear? Okay, so the, um, the other thing is that there is no prepayment penalty. So if you, you know, decided or had somebody who said, you know what, here's a $2,000 gift, I want to help you repay your undergrad debt, you can repay it at any time. There's no prepayment penalties for federal loans. You know, they'd love to have their money back. <laughs> um, so, uh, so the other thing uh, to qualify for aid, and we hadn't got into the, the requirements, is because you have to be enrolled in a degree-seeking program. So you, in this case, you would be the MD or PA program, so degree-seeking program. You have to have half-time enrollment, so you ha whatever the definition of that school is, you have to be enrolled at least half-time, and that is on a term-by-term -term basis. So if it's a semester, it's going to be half-time uh, per semester or half-time per, per uh, quarter. And you have to be making satisfactory academic progress, okay? So that means that uh, you do want to um, be able to um, um, show that you're, you know, making progress. You're not just like repeating courses and things of that nature. So uh, the registrar at the school uh, works very closely with the financial aid office to monitor that and alerts us if there's anybody in trouble. And then, of course, we work and see what other options are available. Um, so what it means is you have to move from one year to the n to the next one. If you are first year student, if you stay again first year. You might you might lose financially. You have to move. You have from first year, you progress to second year. From second year to third year. From third year, fourth and graduation. Right. So you have. Yes, I have a question. Yeah, as far as the student loan works, like, um, how do you receive your payments? Do you get like one bulk payment in the beginning of a quarter, or does it like separate? So the question is, is how do you receive your financial aid? Is it a bulk payment or is it dispersed over quarter? Uh, so the uh, financial aid is dispersed uh, over the course of enrollment, so it's by term. So the school determines what your cost is every term, tuition living expenses, and let's say you're 100% loan, then it would be dispersed in three quarters. Okay. So you would get it at the beginning of the quarter and then you'd be responsible for budgeting that money. Let's say if you lived off campus and had to pay a, a monthly rent. Uh, you'd get, um, you know, five thousand dollars at the, at the, you know, after tuition and fees were paid. You get five thousand dollars, and you'd be responsible for making sure you had that money for October, November, December rent. Okay. Okay. Any other questions on that front? So again, um, the med school organizer and calculator. If <coughs> you want to go into the um, uh, first website, the aanc.org first. And you want to play with some numbers and just, you know, you can log in, create it, your own username, uh, say, okay, I'm going to say I'm going to borrow, you know, I'm going to go to, let's just say Stanford, and uh, I know the cost of attendance for four years, and I'm going to take all loans out, you know, what would it mean in terms of how, what would my payments be? You can either do actual information here, or you can do, you know, play with it, and you could do an estimate what your... 10-year standard repayment program wha would be, what your income sensitive, your graduated payments, uh, extended payments, 25 years. So this is a great tool to start playing with and using just to kind of get a feel for um, what your educational repayment might look like. Yes? So the question is, do, do most medical schools have housing provided? Um, I think the answer is yes. I know it just depends where you are situated. If you go to school in New York City, I think there's housing available through the medical school that's probably not property, but subsidized by the medical school somehow, so you don't pay those exorbitant you know, rents out there. Um, but I could use Stanford uh, as an example. We do have graduate housing. There, are, there is housing available for, specifically for medical students. There's couples housing, there's family housing. So it just depends on the school and, and, the, and the setting, I would think, because you know, whether you're, uh, you're here at UC Davis or at Stanford or you're New York, it's going gonna, it's gonna to differ. On average, like the cost of on-campus housing? Do I know the average? Well, it depends. You know, it really depends. Uh, we have a, a really nice facility. It's called Munger Graduate uh, Facility. It's, it's just gorgeous, but it's very expensive. 
if you live alone versus have a roommate versus have a studio versus live off campus with three roommates, you know, it, it just can vary to, uh, you know, as many combinations as you want. But, uh, uh, you know, and it really depends on whether it's, you know, San Francisco or Boston or, you know, it, it really depends on the, the cost of living in the area where you're applying and going. So I would think that uh, coming to medical school at UC Davis might be a little less expensive housing-wise than if you went to UCSF, just because uh, rents are relatively high in the city. Okay, <coughs> we did talk a little bit, or there were questions out there about repayment assistance and forgiveness. Um, so uh, again, a complete list, a very, f a very uh, comprehensive list, I should say, is available at the uh, at the AANC uh, student loan website. Uh, the National Institutes of Health also have a repayment program for uh, physicians that are going into uh, research. Uh, the National Health Service Corps also has repayments. Uh, National Health Service Corps has a scholarship program that if you apply and get in, they fa pay for four years tuition plus living expenses. Uh, but if you don't get into the scholarship program, they do have a public service loan forgiveness program at the tail end that you might be eligible for. Uh, and again, uh, that is a little bit different because, you, well, you would you would be required to go to an area, an underserved, a medically underserved area at the end of your training. So you may have to do um, three or four years at a, let's say, um, uh, Indian reservation or a rural community clinic that didn't have a physician uh, as, as part of your repayment obligation. And we talked a little bit about the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. Uh, which is a fairly new program, um, and uh, again, additional information can be found at this website. Yes, there's a question. Yeah, for uh, for those, do you pick the area where you want to work, or are you assigned to? For the National Health Service Corps. Yeah. I think what I what I heard the last I spoke to somebody is that they give you like three choices, but you don't necessarily have a choice. Like, say, I want to go to this community clinic in Oregon or something of that nature. You know or Fresno you want to work. Uh, so they do, they do basically look for manpower shortage areas and that's where they want to send you. Yes? When do you do that? Do you do it after med school? Yes, you apply for like the low repayment programs, you, you apply for when you actually enter repayment. So you do that at the end, tail end of your, um, of your training. Uh, but you want to start. In, you want to start educating yourself now, so you'll know what those options are. You don't want to wait till the tail end and say, uh, you know." You just want to have a plan. And do you know how long you're going to be in that service corps? Are we talking the National Health Service Corps? Mm -hmm. It's usually a year-to-year -year ratio. So if they provide a year of funding, for every year of um, of service, they provide. Uh, I think it's is it, it's two years of service. Well, one year of finance, two years of service. Yeah, one year of finance, two years of service. But the public s loan forgiveness program, you know, I don't have the exact dollar amount that's forgiven. I'm sorry, I don't have that. Um, when you're doing the service, are you getting paid during that time? Or yes, you're earning your you're earning a salary, whatever the salary is at the institution or you know place that you're at. You'll you'll be earning your salary. Okay. Okay. Um, Part three and four of this presentation was is going to be, you know, manage your money wisely. I think I started by saying something at the beginning about, you know, live like a student today so that you can live like a doctor tomorrow. Uh, you know, you're going to be living on a fixed budget. Um, you know, you might be used to that daily or weekly Starbucks fix or, um, you know, and, and that can really add up, uh, you know, uh, eating out versus cooking at home, um, biking versus driving. Um, you know, going to the movies versus renting a movie, all of those things, uh, you know, are choices that you're going to have to look at and think about lifestyle choices that are going to make um, an impact on your educational debt. So, you know, being a medical student does require sacrifice, uh, not only time, but, you know, and money and resources. So you do need to start thinking about that uh, earlier versus later, okay? So that is our... Uh, I'm not going to go into the following, but is, are there any questions, additional questions that we can answer? Yes. Um, how about for international students? Interna for those who are not U.S. citizens and permanent residents, what are the financial aid options for them? Well, currently, as I 
as I men mentioned, uh, some schools may offer their institutional aid, and it's a school by school basis. So, you know, you might want to go to the AAMC website and say, you know, international, and, you know, just Google that and see what comes up. Um, I do know that there are medical schools out there that provide their institutional aid. Federal aid is not an option, but there are private loans out there, either uh, with a, usually with an established U.S. citizen as a co-signer. Okay, Robert? I think the, the answer comes here. There are three types of financial aid available for medical schools, the source of financial aid. The first source of financial aid is the federal government, which provides you almost all the loans you need. So international students cannot participate in, the, in that program, okay? The second financial aid source is the school where you are applying. You apply to UC Davis, UC Davis from its own money will provide you some financial aid. The same thing with Harvard, the same thing with other schools. For that part of financial aid, international students depends on the school. Some school provides for international students, some school they don't provide. So if, if a school doesn't provide from its own money financial aid to international students, that means there is no financial aid for that international <coughs> student because he doesn't get from the federal, he doesn't get from the school, he can't participate in the service program that Marty mentioned, the military and all the, uh, the Navy, all they are outside, they will give you a detailed information. That's the third type of financial aid. So <coughs> the international students have one chance, that is the school. And also, of course, private loan, if they can find a permanent resident or a U.S. citizen that co-signs the loan for them. That answer your question? You know, I, I also just remembered another important uh, uh, piece of information about federal loans is that um, we were asked a question not too long ago about a student saying, well, you know, the home equity loans are so low right now, you can take a home equity loan for maybe 3%. So instead of, um, instead of taking out this unsubsidized Stafford loan that accrues 6.8%, why shouldn't my parents take out a 3% against their house and then, you know, they would just be paying 3% instead of 6.8%? Well, the, the problem with that is that federal loans, um, basically they're guaranteed, but they will be discharged if you die. They can be discharged upon death or permanent disability. And if your parents were to take out that 3% loan, guess what? It's their loan. It's not yours. And so they would still have that loan even if you were not there. So um, be really cautious of, of that particular trap. Uh, it's uh, something that you don't think about, but, uh, you know, and, and of course that private loan, that home equity loan, wouldn't be eligible for public service or any other kind of loan forgiveness. Yes? Um, a question is coming from the web audience, um, and it's an interesting one, and it's one that comes up oftentimes uh, discussions of financial aid for med school. And it's the question of at what point is a, is a, is a student considered independent from their parents? Um, is there a number of, is there an age? I love this is question. There a, uh, is it there a depends. Of so uh, do I want to repeat the question? Yes. Okay, so the, the question is at what point in time does the student become independent for financial aid uh, while, as a medical school applicant? And the answer is it depends. It's really specific to the institution. Again, for federal financial aid, you are independent. You do not have to provide any information from uh, of, of your parents. Uh, but for institutional aid, we, you know, it, it depends. You, uh, there could be an age cutoff at Stanford. It's 30 years. If you are 30 at, at the beginning of the academic year, we will exclude your parental information. Uh, so maybe you, you matriculate. You're 28 years old, 28, 29. You don't get any grant, and then you turn 30 in your third year. Guess what? You might be eligible for full grant. Um, I think Yale has an age limit of 29. Uh, some require information regardless if you're married. So it really depends. Uh, we do have a provision uh, under our professional judgment, which uh, if there is um, absolute estrangement, so let's just say that there's you know, been no contact with the family or you were um, uh, emancipated, I guess is the correct term, um, and we have that proof from your undergraduate, we will exclude parental, but it's a case-by-case -case basis. It is, uh, it's the same, <coughs> the same answer I gave you with the international thing, depending the type of financial aid available, 
the federal program, the school program, and the service base. So each portion have its own policy and rules. So the federal is clarified that if you are a US citizen and enrolled in medical school or graduate school, you are independent. Schools, it's their own money. They have their own rules. That's what the difference is. Thank you, Abra. Yes. Um, I heard that with some private institutions, if your household income is below a certain threshold, they'll cover um, part or like full of your. Sounds tuition. like you're talking about Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> is that what you're talking about when you said that a financial aid resource is part of the school where you're applying to? So, yeah, it just depends on you know how deep the pocket is at the school. If you have a huge endowment, uh, so the question is is um, uh, she had heard that there are. Um, institutions that if your family income is uh, under a certain threshold that the school provides full tuition. And I think Harvard um, uh, started that as an undergraduate program. I think Princeton, then Harvard, and then medical school picked that up. Uh, but I think that's the only school that I know of that does that. I think uh, you are talking about undergraduate program. Most Ivy League schools and highly endowed schools, mm -hmm. they do have programs less than 60,000 free education, less than 100,000 tuition only. That is not in the medical school. There is only, to my knowledge, there is only one medical school that defines less than 120,000 income tuition, almost tuition free, is Harvard. I haven't heard any no, other nobody's school. Nobody else has jumped on yeah. that wagon. <laughs> so there is only one that we heard, yeah. okay? Okay. Yes. Um, so you had a slide up there that had, um, it was like 86% of graduates have $180,000 in debt or something along those yeah. lines. But the remaining funds to pay for medical school, are those mostly family contributions? Are those mostly grants and scholarships? Do you have any idea what the percentage is of What each? the breakdown is? Uh, you know, I, I can only go, I, I don't know uh, aggregate for mm -hmm. all schools. I know it is available. I can tell you what it is at Stanford. I mean, you know, I, I do know that information at Stanford. So the cost of uh, attendance, I believe it is 40% uh, grant, about 40%, it's about 40% grant, 40% loan at our school and 20% other. So that could be family or outside resources. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a combination. I mean, that's what it is at our school. I know that we, we report this information to the association, the AAMC every year, so I know it's out there. I just don't have it at the top of my head. Yes. Uh, excellent. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, so uh, she's asking whether or not there's federal work study or work study available. And it really is on a school by school basis. Uh, the work study program, uh, we do have one at Stanford. It's, it's minimum, but what it does is uh, Students, uh, generally in their second year, so after the first year and the second year, it gets a little bit you know, less crazy, um, they're able to teach um, courses that they were in as first year medical students. Um, so they work as teaching assistants for the first year courses. And they can do that for other classes throughout campus. Um, so they're able to offset their educational loan expense by working as TAs. Uh, and we, we have a, a great program at Stanford. Um, I'll use as an example that uh, an anatomy TA, uh, so we have second year students, there are about 10 hired every year to help teach the anatomy, um, you know, the gross anatomy course. They're uh, hired as a 50% TA in autumn and 25% TA in winter. And that equals dollar wise about $26,000. So yes, the 25, uh, 50% is 20 hours a week. It's based on 40 hour work week. 25% uh, is 10 hours a week and they're taking courses in between and what have you, but uh, they're able to offset their educational expenses. Um, not all schools have a flexible curriculum, so it may not be available, but you know, as you're applying for medical school, you might, that'd be an excellent question to ask. Are there work study opportunities available to minimize my debt? It's a good question. The uh, work study program. The work study program is <coughs> mostly undergraduate program, or work study is, you work and you earn. <coughs> Unfortunately, medical school, there is no time to work. So that is where the problem is. In some schools, you might earn, but in most schools, especially in your 
second, third, fourth year, you are in clinical rotation, you are 24 hours. I don't think you have the time to work. Yeah. That's the answer. But uh, there are opportunities at some institutions to have uh, like paid research. You work in a lab a few hours a week and they pay you hourly. So there are opportunities. It just depends on the institution. Uh, I, I could speak for our institution that we do have a work study program that is, is, is really quite, quite popular, very generous, and uh, many students take advantage of it. Yes? You've partly answered the question already that I'm about to ask, but I'll ask it anyway because I think a lot of students would like some additional clarity around um, medical school policy on working outside of a formally recognized work-study program in the event that there is one. For example, can someone take on a part-time job uh, where maybe the job is flexible enough um, to work it into and accommodate for the class schedule in the first and second year? But do schools have official policies prohibiting that in some cases? So the question is, uh, working outside the medical school part-time jobs while you're a full-time student, highly discouraged, highly, highly discouraged. And I do believe uh, most schools have a policy. Um, and you know, it would, be, you, you would, it would be evident that you know, th those students that have that type of situation would probably be having academic difficulties. Um, so I think that, you know, unless it's part of the curriculum, then it would be discouraged. Yeah, that, that's, that's the same yeah. thing, highly it's discouraged. It's yeah. not that they don't have to work. It's just the time commitment they have for their own classes prohibit them from working outside. But if the question is working outside, how it's treated in financial aid, that's a different. That's a different question. <laughs> sure. So, so any any resource that you have so you know a, any any work e even if it's in school it's considered a resource and it's used in your financial aid calculation how schools treat that varies on the school we use it for the current year some schools say okay you worked as a teaching assistant last year we'll assess it next year and your next year cuz uh, for financial aid we all most schools use prior year income as a proxy for your financial aid for the, the current year because that's the most accurate picture that we have. And I think the other question, the other, the other point that I should make is um, uh, most schools will entertain um, uh, petitions for review. Uh, so let's say there's just some extenuating circumstances, uh, illness in the family, extraordinary medical expenses, emergency travel to for a funeral or something like that. Uh, something of that nature. So most schools will accommodate those type of extenuating circumstances and will make an adjustment in your financial aid to accommodate. So there are, you know, it's not <coughs> hard and fast. There are opportunities to, to make those adjustments. No question? I think there is one burning, uh, oh, is that? There is one burning question that I collected and I, I'm asking you again the question was, how can I afford medical school? Do you think this presentation answered that question? Because that's why you are here. Does anybody think they can't afford medical school? The Great. whole idea of the presentation is when you leave this, you believe that medical schools are affordable. Yeah, even if you feel that your family can't help you, you'll be able to help yourself. You know, and you'll have resources around <coughs> available to you that will help finance your education. And, you know, that's half of the battle is just making sure that you can see beyond that. You can see, you could see the, you could see the target, and the target is that MD degree. The, the hardest part is really to get <coughs> in. <coughs> Once you get in, I can guarantee you the next day, if you go to the financial aid office and say, I'm here, I'm admitted, I need money. <laughs> financial aid will prepare you all the money you need. It doesn't mean that all the money you like, <laughs> but <laughs> all the money you need to go, I mean, to continue your education. That's an important so qualifier. <laughs> the, the one thing I really want is in your mind when you leave this is to leave, oh, now I can go medical school, I can afford it. Okay. Thank you.